When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Good evening, kitties. It is I, your host, Mr. Whiskers, the Mad Catter, bringing you another episode of Twisted Tea Time. For tonight's tea, well, I'm still drinking actual tea, with lemon even, as my throat is a touch on the rough side still. Damned mortal host bodies and their weak mortal weaknesses. Nah. Well, as talking hurts, I'll try and keep this short. First, if you want to support this show, the easiest way to do so is by going on to iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn Radio and giving us a positive review. Also, sharing the show helps as well. More listeners means more support for our sponsors means... More money for wine, and that is always a fine thing to have on hand when one's throat isn't a pit of suffering. Now, that shameless self-promotion out of the way, tonight brings us two tales. The first is by an unknown author and involves a young man acquiring employment in a particular field. Exploring the powers of imagination as well as his own subconscious. And soon he finds that perhaps he shouldn't have begun to imagine his... Tulpa. Tulpa by Author Unknown. Last year, I spent six months participating in what I was told was a psychological experiment. I found an ad in my local paper looking for imaginative people looking to make good money. And since it was the only ad that week that I was remotely qualified for, I gave them a call and we arranged an interview. They told me that all I would have to do is stay in a room alone, with sensors attached to my head to read my brain activity. And while I was there, I would visualize a double of myself. They called it my tulpa. It seemed easy enough, and I agreed to do it as soon as they told me how much I would be paid. And the next day, I began. They brought me to a simple room and gave me a bed then attached sensors to my head and hooked them into a little black box on the table beside me. They talked me through the process of visualizing my double again, and explained that if I got bored or restless, instead of moving around, I should visualize my double moving around, or try to interact with him, and so on. The idea was to keep him with me the entire time I was in the room. I had trouble with it for the first few days. It was more controlled than any sort of daydreaming I'd done before. I'd imagine my double for a few minutes, then grow distracted. But by the fourth day, I could manage to keep him present for the entire six hours. They told me I was doing very well. The second week, they gave me a different room, with wall-mounted speakers. They told me they wanted to see if I could still keep the tulpa with me in spite of distracting stimuli. The music was discordant, ugly and unsettling, and it made the process a little more difficult. But I managed nonetheless. 
The next week, they played even more unsettling music, punctuated with shrieks, feedback loops, what sounded like an old-school modem dialing up, and guttural voices speaking some foreign language. I just laughed it off. I was a pro by then. After about a month, I started to get bored. To liven things up, I started interacting with my doppelganger. We'd have conversations, or play rock-paper-scissors, or I'd imagine him juggling, or breakdancing, or whatever caught my fancy. I asked the researchers if my foolishness would adversely affect their study, but they encouraged me. So we played and communicated, and that was fun for a while. And then it got a little strange. I was telling him about my first date one day, and he corrected me. I'd said my date was wearing a yellow top, and he told me it was a green one. I thought about it for a second, and realized he was right. It creeped me out, and after my shift that day, I talked to the researchers about it. You're using the thought form to access your subconscious, they explained. You knew on some level that you were wrong, and you subconsciously corrected yourself. What had once been creepy was suddenly cool. I was talking to my subconscious. It took some practice, but I found that I could question my tulpa and access all sorts of memories. I could make it quote whole pages of books I'd read once years before, or things I was taught and immediately forgot in high school. <laughs> it was awesome. That was around the time I started calling up my double outside of the research center. Not often at first, but I was so used to imagining him by now that it almost seemed odd to not see him. So whenever I was bored, I'd visualize my double. Eventually, I started doing it almost all the time. It was amusing to take him along like an invisible friend. I imagined him when I was hanging out with friends or visiting my mom. I even brought him along on a date once. I didn't need to speak aloud to him, so I was able to carry out conversations with him, and no one was the wiser. I know that sounds strange, but it was fun. Not only was he a walking repository of everything I knew and everything I had forgotten, he also seemed more in touch with me than I did at times. He had an uncanny grasp of the minutia of body language that I didn't even realize I was picking up on. For example, I'd thought the date I brought him along was going badly, but he pointed out how she was laughing a little too hard at my jokes and leaning towards me as I spoke, and a bunch of other subtle cues I wasn't consciously picking up on. I listened, and let's just say that date went very well. By the time I'd been at the research center for four months, he was with me constantly. The researchers approached me one day after my shift and asked me if I'd stop visualizing him. I denied it, and they seemed pleased. I silently asked my double if he knew what prompted that, but he just shrugged it off. So did I. I withdrew a little from the world at that point. I was having trouble relating to people. It seemed to me that they were so confused and unsure of themselves, while I had a manifestation of myself to confer with. It made socializing awkward. Nobody else seemed aware of the reasons behind their actions, why some things made them mad and others made them laugh. They didn't know what moved them, but I did. Or at least... I could ask myself and get an answer. A friend confronted me one evening. He pounded at the door until I answered it, and came in fuming and swearing up a storm. 
You haven't answered when I called you in fucking weeks, you dick, he yelled. What's your fucking problem? I was about to apologize to him, and probably would have offered to hit the bars with him that night, but my tulpa grew suddenly furious. Hit him, it said. And before I knew what I was doing, I had. I heard his nose break. He fell to the floor and came up swinging, and we beat each other up and down my apartment. I was more furious than I had ever been, and I was not merciful. I knocked him to the ground and gave him two savage kicks to the ribs, and that was when he fled, hunched over and sobbing. The police were by a few minutes later. But I told him that he had been the instigator, and since he wasn't around to refute me, they let me off with a warning. My tulpa was grinning the entire time. We spent the night crowing about my victory and sneering over how badly I'd beaten my friend. It wasn't until the next morning, when I was checking out my black eye and cut lip in the mirror, that I remembered what had set me off. My double was the one who'd grown furious, not me. I'd been feeling guilty and a little ashamed, but he goaded me into a vicious fight with a concerned friend. He was present, of course, and knew my thoughts. You don't need him anymore. You don't need anyone else, he told me, and I felt my skin crawl. I explained all this to the researchers who employed me, but they just laughed it off. You can't be scared of something that you're imagining, one told me. My double stood beside him and nodded his head, then smirked at me. I tried to take their words to heart, but over the next few days I found myself growing more and more anxious around my tulpa, and it seemed that he was changing. He looked taller and more menacing. His eyes twinkled with mischief, and I saw malice in his constant smile. No job was worth losing my mind over, I decided. If he was out of control, I'd put him down. I was so used to him at that point that visualizing him was an automatic process, so I started trying my damnedest to not visualize him. It took a few days, but it started to work somewhat. I could get rid of him for hours at a time, but every time he came back... He seemed worse. His skin seemed ashen, his teeth more pointed. He hissed and gibbered and threatened and swore. The discordant music I'd been listening to for months seemed to accompany him everywhere. Even when I was at home, I'd relax and slip up, no longer concentrating on not seeing him. And there he'd be that howling noise with him. I was still visiting the research center and spending my six hours there. I needed the money, and I thought they weren't aware that I was now actively not visualizing my tulpa. I was wrong. After my shift one day, about five and a half months in, two impressive men grabbed and restrained me and someone in a lab coat jabbed a hypodermic needle into my body. I woke up from my stupor, back in the room strapped into the bed, music blaring, with my doppelganger standing over me, cackling. He hardly looked human anymore. His features were twisted. His eyes were sunken in their sockets and filmed over like a corpse's. He was much taller than me, but hunched over. His hands were twisted and the fingernails were like talons. 
He was, in short, fucking terrified. I tried to will him away, but I just couldn't seem to concentrate. He giggled and tapped the IV in my arm. I thrashed in my restraints as best I could, but could hardly move at all. They're pumping you full of the good shit, I think. How's the mind? All fuzzy. He leaned closer and closer as he spoke. I gagged. His breath smelt like spoiled meat. I tried to focus, but I couldn't banish him. The next few weeks were terrible. Every so often, someone in a doctor's coat would come in and inject me with something, or force-feed me a pill. They kept me dizzy and unfocused, and sometimes left me hallucinating or delusional. My thought form was still present, constantly mocking. He interacted with, or perhaps caused, my delusions. I hallucinated that my mother was there scolding me, and then he cut her throat, and her blood showered me. It was so real that I could taste it. The doctors never spoke to me. I begged at times, screamed, hurled invectives, demanded answers. They never spoke to me. They may have talked to my tulpa, my personal monster. I'm not sure. I was so doped up and confused that it may have just been more delusion, but I remember them talking with him. I grew convinced that he was the real one, and I was the thought form. He encouraged that line of thought at times, mocked me at others. Another thing that I pray was delusion. He could touch me. More than that, he could hurt me. He'd poke and prod at me if he felt I wasn't paying enough attention to him. Once he grabbed my testicles and squeezed until I told him I loved him. Another time he slashed my forearm with one of his talons. I still have a scar. Most days I can convince myself that I injured myself and just hallucinated that he was responsible. Most days. Then one day, while he was telling me a story about how he was going to gut everyone I loved, starting with my sister. He paused. A querulous look crossed his face and reached out and touched my head, like my mother used to when I was feverish. He stayed still for a long moment and then smiled. All thoughts are creative, he told me. Then he walked out the door. Three hours later, I was given an injection and passed out. I awoke, unrestrained, shaking. I made my way to the door and found it unlocked. I walked out into the empty hallway and then ran. I stumbled more than once, but I made it down the stairs and out into the lot behind the building. There, I collapsed, weeping like a child. I knew I had to keep moving, but I couldn't manage it. I got home eventually. I don't remember how. I locked the door and shoved a dresser against it, took a long shower, and slept for a day and a half. Nobody came for me in the night, and nobody came the next day, or the one after that. It was over. I'd spent a week locked in that room, but it had felt like a century. I'd withdrawn so much from my life beforehand that nobody had even known I was missing. The police didn't find anything. The research center was empty when they searched it. The paper trail fell apart. The names I'd given them were aliases. 
Even the money I'd receive was apparently untraceable. I recovered as much as one can. I don't leave the house much, and I have panic attacks when I do. I cry a lot. I don't sleep much, and my nightmares are terrible. It's over, I tell myself. I survived. I use the concentration those bastards taught me to convince myself. It works. Sometimes. Not today, though. Three days ago, I got a phone call from my mother. There's been a tragedy. My sister's the latest victim in a spree of killings, the police say. The perpetrator mugs his victims, then guts them. The funeral was this afternoon. It was as lovely a service as a funeral can be, I suppose. I was a little distracted, though. All I could hear was music coming from somewhere distant. Discordant, unsettling stuff that sounds like feedback and shrieking and a modem dialing up. I hear it still, a little louder now. Welcome back, kitties. I do hope you enjoyed that yarn. <clears throat> it seems only fitting that the sound of a dial-up modem would herald horror, don't you think? <laughs> oh, my throat. Um, now, for our next tale, we continue the Pen Pal Saga with our second exploration of that story in this chapter about a little cute kitty. Oh, I like kitties. I'm sure nothing but wonderful and happy things are in store when cats are involved. Now, who am I kidding? <laughs> Sit back, relax, and let's hear about our protagonist's little feline named... Boxes. Boxes. Pen Pal by 1000 Vultures Part 2 Boxes I spent the summer before my first year of elementary school learning how to climb trees. There was one particular pine tree right outside my house that seemed almost designed for me it had branches that were so low I could easily grab them without a boost. And for the first couple days after I first learned how to pull myself up, I would just sit on the lowest branch dangling my feet. The tree was outside our back fence and was easily visible from the kitchen window which was just above the sink. Before too long, my mother and I developed a routine where I would go play on the tree when she washed the dishes, because she could easily see me while she did other things. As the summer passed, my abilities grew, and before long I was climbing fairly high. As the tree got taller, its branches not only got thinner, but more widely spaced. I eventually reached a point where I couldn't actually climb any higher, and so the game had to change. I began to concentrate on speed, and in the end, I could reach my highest branch in 25 seconds. I got too confident one afternoon. I tried to step from a branch before I had firmly grasped the next one. I fell about 20 feet and broke my arm really badly in two places. My mom was running toward me, yelling, and I remember her sounding like she was underwater. I don't remember what she said, but I do remember being surprised by just how white my bone was. 
I was going to start kindergarten with a cast and wouldn't even have any friends to sign it. My mom must have felt terrible because the day before I started school, she brought home a kitten. He was just a baby and was striped with tan and white. As soon as she put him down, he crawled into an empty case of soda that was sitting on the floor. I named him Boxes. Boxes was only an outside cat when he escaped. My mom had him declawed so he wouldn't destroy the furniture. So as a result, we did our best to keep him inside. He'd get out every now and then, and we'd find him somewhere in the backyard chasing some kind of bug or lizard, though he could hardly ever catch one because he had no front claws. He was pretty evasive, but we'd always catch him and carry him back inside. He'd scramble to look back over my shoulder. <laughs> I told Mom it was because he was planning his strategy for the next time. Once inside, we'd give him some tuna fish, and he came to learn what the sound of the can opener might signal. He'd come running whenever he heard it. This conditioning came in handy later because toward the end of our time in that house, boxes would get out much more often and would run under the house into the crawl space where neither of us wanted to follow because it was cramped and probably crawling with bugs and rodents. Ingeniously, my mom thought to hook the can opener to an extension cord out back and run it outside the hole that Boxes had gone through. Eventually, he would emerge with his loud meows, looking excited by the sound and then horrified at how we could run such a cruel ruse on him. A can opener with no tuna made no sense to Boxes. The last time he escaped under the house was actually our last day in it. My mom had put the house on the market and we had begun packing our things. We didn't have much, and we stretched the packing out a while. Though I had already packed up all my clothes at my mom's request, my mom could tell I was really sad about moving and wanted the transition to be smooth for me. And I guess she thought that my having my clothes in the box would reinforce the idea that we were moving, but things wouldn't change that much. When boxes got out as we were loading some things into the moving van, my mom cursed because she had already packed the can opener and wasn't sure where it was. I pretended to go look for it so I wouldn't have to go under the house, and my mom, probably completely aware of my little scam, moved one of the panels and crawled in. She came out with boxes pretty quickly and seemed pretty unnerved, which made me feel even better about getting out of it. My mom made some phone calls while I packed a little more, and then she came into my room and told me that she had spoken to the realtor and we were going to start moving into the other house that day. She said it like it was excellent news, but I thought we had more time in the house. She originally said that we weren't moving until the end of the next week and it was only Tuesday. What's more, we weren't completely finished packing. But my mom said sometimes it was just easier to replace things than pack them and haul them all over the city. I didn't even get to grab the rest of my boxed clothes. I asked if I could call Josh to say bye, but she said that we could just call him from our new house. We left in the moving van. I managed to stay in touch with Josh for years, which is surprising since we no longer went to the same school. Our parents weren't close friends, but they knew that we were, and so they would accommodate our desire to see one another by driving us back and forth for sleepovers, sometimes every weekend. For Christmas one year, our parents even pooled their money and got us some really nice walkie-talkies that were advertised to work across a range that extended past the distance between our houses. They also had batteries that could last for days if the walkie-talkie was on, but not used. They would only occasionally work well enough that we could talk across the city, 
But when we stayed over, we'd use them around the house, talking in mock radio speak that we had taken from movies, and they worked great for that. Thanks to our parents, we were still friends when we were ten. One weekend, I was staying over at Josh's and my mom called me to say goodnight. She was still pretty watchful, even when she couldn't actually watch me, but I had gotten so used to it that I didn't even notice it, even if Josh did. She sounded upset. Boxes was missing. This must have been a Saturday night, because I had spent the night at Josh's the previous night and was going to go home the next day because we had school on Monday. Boxes had been missing since Friday afternoon. I gathered that she had not seen him since returning home after dropping me off. She must have decided to tell me he was missing because if he didn't come home before I did, then I would be devastated at not only his absence, but how she could have kept it from me. She told me not to worry. He'll come back. He always does. But Boxes didn't come back. Three weeks later, I stayed at Josh's again. I was still upset about Boxes, but my mom told me that there had been many times when pets had disappeared from home for weeks or even months, only to return on their own. She said they always knew where home was and would always try to get back. I was explaining this to Josh when a thought hit me so hard that I interrupted my own sentence to say it aloud. What if Boxes thought of the wrong home? Josh was confused. What? He lives with you. He knows where his home is. But he grew up somewhere else, Josh. He was raised in my old house a couple neighborhoods away. Maybe he thinks of that place as home, like I do. Oh, I get it. Well, that'd be great. We'll tell my dad tomorrow and he'll take us over there so we can look. No, he won't, man. My mom said that we couldn't ever go back to that place because the new owners wouldn't want to be bothered. She said that she told your mom and dad the same thing. Josh persisted. Okay, then we'll just go out exploring tomorrow and make our way to your old house. No. If we get spotted, your dad will find out, and then so will my mom. We have to go there ourselves. We have to go there tonight. It didn't take that much convincing to get Josh on board, since he was usually the one to come up with ideas like this. But we had never snuck out of his house before. It actually turned out to be incredibly easy. The window in his room opened to the backyard, and he had a latched wooden fence that wasn't locked. After those two minor hurdles, we slipped off into the night, flashlight and walkie-talkies in hand. There were two ways to get from Josh's house to my old house. We could walk on the street and make all the turns or go through the woods, which would take about half the time. It would have taken about two hours to walk there taking the street, but I suggested that we go that way anyway. I told him it was because I didn't want to get lost. Josh refused and said that if we were seen, they might recognize him and tell his dad. He threatened to go home if we didn't just take the shortcut. And I accepted it because I didn't want to go by myself. Josh didn't know about the last time I walked through these woods at night. The woods were much less creepy with a friend and a flashlight, and we were making pretty good time. I wasn't entirely sure where we were, but Josh seemed confident enough and that bolstered my morale. We passed through a particularly thick patch of tangled trees when the strap on my walkie-talkie got caught on a branch. Josh had the flashlight, so I was struggling to get the walkie-talkie free when I heard Josh say, Hey man, wanna go for a swim? I looked over to where he was shining the flashlight, though I closed my eyes as he did because 
I now knew where we were. He was pointing at the pool float. This was where I had woken up in these woods all those years ago. I felt a lump in my throat and the sting of fresh tears in my eyes as I continued to struggle with the walkie. Frustrated, I yanked on it hard enough to break it free, and I turned and walked to Josh, who had partially laid down on the pool float in a mock sunbathing pose. As I walked toward him, I stumbled and nearly fell into a fairly large hole that was sitting in the middle of this small clearing. But I regained my balance and stopped right at its edge. It was deep. I was surprised by the size of the hole, but more surprised by the fact that I didn't remember it. I realized it must not have been there that night because it was in the same spot where I had awoken. I put it out of my mind and turned to Josh. Quit messing around, man. You saw I was stuck over there and you were just laying here joking around on this float. I punctuated the sentence with a kick to an exposed part of the float. Screeching rose from it. Josh's smile inverted. He suddenly looked terrified and was struggling to get off the float, but he couldn't in a quick manner due to the awkward way he had been laying on it. Each time he would fall back on the float, the screeching would intensify. I wanted to help Josh, but I couldn't move myself any closer. My legs wouldn't cooperate. I hated these woods. I picked up the flashlight that he had thrown in his thrashing and shined it on the float, not knowing what to expect. Finally, Josh got off the float and rushed next to me, looking at where I was shining the light. Suddenly, there it was. It was a rat. I started laughing nervously, and we both watched the rat run into the woods, taking the screeches with it. Josh lightly punched me in the arm, the smile slowly returning to his face, and we continued walking. We quickened our pace and made it out of the woods faster than we thought we would, and we found ourselves back in my old neighborhood. The last time I had rounded the bend ahead, I had seen my house fully illuminated and all the memories of what transpired came flooding back. I felt a skipping in my heart as we were finally turning the corner and about to face the full view of my house, remembering last time how incandescent it was. But this time, all the lights were off. From a distance, I could see my old climbing tree and as my mind traced the steps of causality backward, I realized that I wouldn't be back here this night if that tree hadn't grown. And I was briefly in awe of how all events were like that. As we got closer, I could see that the lawn looked terrible. I couldn't even guess when it had last been mowed. One of the shutters had partially broken loose and was rocking back and forth in the breeze, and overall the house just looked... dirty. I was sad to see my old home in such a state of disrepair. Why would my mom care if we bothered the new owners if they cared so little about where they lived? And then I realized... there were no new owners. The house was abandoned, though it looked simply forsaken. Why would Mom lie to me about our house having new people in it? But I thought that this was actually a good thing. It would be easier to look around for boxes if we didn't have to worry about being spotted by the new family. This would make it much quicker. Josh interrupted my thoughts as we walked through the gate and up to the house itself. Your house sucks, dude, Josh yelled as quietly as he could. Shut up, Josh. Even like this, it's nicer than your house. Hey, man. Okay, okay. 
I think Boxes is probably under the house. One of us has to go under and look, but the other should stay next to the opening in case he comes running out. Are you serious? There's no way I'm going under there. It's your cat, man. You do it. Look, I'll game you for it, unless you're scared. I said, holding my fist over my upturned palm. Fine, but we go on shoot, not on three. It's rock, paper, scissors, shoot, not one, two, three. I know how to play the game, Josh. You're the one who always messes up, and it's two out of three. I lost. I wiggled loose the panel that my mom would always move when she had to crawl under here for boxes. She only had to do it a couple of times since the can opener trick usually worked. But when she had to do it, she hated it, especially that last time. And as I looked into the darkness of the crawl space, I had a greater appreciation for why. Before we moved, she said that it was actually better that boxes ran under here. Despite how hard it could be to get him out, it was less dangerous than him jumping over the fence and running around the neighborhood. All that was true, but I was still dreading doing this. I grabbed the flashlight and the walkie and began to crawl in. A powerful smell overtook me. It smelled like death. I turned on my walkie. Josh, are you there? This is Macho Man, come back. Josh, cut it out. There's something wrong down here. What do you mean? It stinks. It smells like something died. Is it boxes? I really hope not. I set down the walkie and moved the flashlight around as I crawled forward. Looking through the hole from the outside, you could see all the way back with the right lighting. But you had to be inside to see around the support blocks that held the house up. I'd say that there was about 40% of the area that you couldn't see unless you were actually in the crawl space. But even inside, I discovered that I could only see directly where the flashlight was pointing. I realized that this would make scouting around the place much more difficult. As I moved forward, the smell intensified. The fear was growing in me that boxes had come here and something had happened to him. I shined the flashlight around, but couldn't see much of anything. I wrapped my fingers around a support block to pull myself forward, and as I did that... I felt something that made my hand recoil. Fur. My heart sank, and I prepared myself emotionally for what I was about to see. I crawled slowly so I could prolong what I knew was coming, and I inched my eyes and the flashlight past the block to see what was on the other side. I staggered back in horror. Jesus Christ! Escaped my trembling mouth. It was a hideous and twisted creature, badly decomposed. Its skin had rotted away on its face, so the teeth appeared to be enormous, and the smell was unbearable. What is it? Are you okay? Is it boxes? I reached for the walkie. No, it's not boxes. Well, what the hell is it then? I don't know. I shined the light on it again and looked at it with less fear in my vision. I chuckled. It's a raccoon. Well, keep looking. I'm going to go into the house to see if he might have made it in there somehow. What? No, Josh, don't go in there. What if Boxes is down here and he runs out? He can't. I put the boards back. I looked and saw that he was telling the truth. Why'd you do that? Don't worry, man. You can move it easy. This makes more sense. If Boxes ran out and I missed him, then he'd be gone. 
If he's down there, then grab him tight and I'll come move the board. And if he's not, then you can move it yourself while I look in the house. Some of his points were good, and I doubted he'd be able to get in anyway. Okay, but be careful and don't touch anything. There's a bunch of my old clothes still in boxes in my room. You can look in there to see if he crawled in one. And make sure you bring your walkie. Roger that, good buddy. I realized that it would be pitch black in there. The power would have been turned off since no one was paying the bill. With any luck, he'd be able to see from the streetlights that might cast some light inside. Otherwise, I'm not sure what he'd do. Before long, I heard footsteps right over my head and felt old dirt raining down on me. Josh, is that you? Shh! Breaker, breaker, this is Macho Man coming back for the big tango foxtrot. The eagle has landed. What's your 20, Princess Jasmine? Over. Asshole. Macho Man, my 20 is in your bathroom looking at your stash of magazines. Looks like you got a thing for dudes' butts. What's the report on that? Over. I could hear him laughing without the walkie, and I started laughing too. I heard the footsteps fade away a little. He was on his way to my room. Man, it's dark in here. Hey, are you sure you had boxes of clothes in here? I don't see any. Yeah, there should be a couple of boxes in front of the closet. There aren't any boxes in here. Let me check to see if you maybe put the boxes in the closet before you left. I started thinking that maybe my mom had come back and gotten the clothes and just given them away, because I had outgrown a lot of them. But I remembered leaving the boxes there. I didn't even have time to close the last one up before we left. While I was waiting for Josh to tell me what he found, I kicked out my leg which had started falling asleep because of the position it was in, and it hit something. I looked back and saw something really strange. It was a blanket, and all around it there were bowls. I crawled a little closer to it. The blanket smelled moldy, and most of the bowls were empty, but one had something that I recognized still in it. Cat food. It was a different kind than we gave to boxes, but I suddenly understood. My mom had set up a little place for boxes to encourage him to come here instead of running around the neighborhood. That made a lot of sense, and it seemed even more likely that boxes would have come back to this place. That's so, so cool, cool, Mom, Mom I thought. I found your clothes. Oh, cool. Where were the boxes? Like I said, there are no boxes. Your clothes are in your closet. They're hanging up. I felt a chill. This was impossible. I had packed all my clothes. Even though we weren't supposed to move for another two weeks when we left, I remember packing them and thinking that it was stupid for me to have to get clothes out of the box and put them back in. I had packed them, but someone had hung them back up. Why, though? Josh needed to get out of there. That can't be right, Josh. They're supposed to be in boxes. Stop messing around and just come back outside. No joke, man. I'm looking at them. Maybe you just thought that you left them. <laughs> wow, you sure like to look at yourself, don't you? What? What do you mean? Your walls, man! <laughs> Your walls are covered in Polaroids of yourself. There are hundreds of them. What did you hire someone to? Silence. I checked my walkie to see if I had switched it off somehow. It was fine. I could hear footsteps, but couldn't tell exactly where Josh was going. I waited for Josh to finish his sentence, thinking that his finger had just slipped off the button, but he didn't continue. He seemed to be stomping around the house now. 
was just about to radio him when he came back. There's someone in the house. His voice was hushed and broken. I could hear he was on the verge of tears. I wanted to respond, but how loud was his walkie turned up? What if the other person heard it? I said nothing and just waited and listened. What I heard were footsteps. Heavy, dragging footsteps. And then a loud thud. Oh God, Josh, he had been found. I was sure of it. This person had found him and was hurting him. I broke out in tears. He was my only friend next to boxes. And then I realized, what if Josh told him I was under here? What could I possibly do? As I struggled to compose myself, I thankfully heard Josh's voice through the walkie. He's got something, man. It's a big bag. He just threw it on the floor and... And... Oh, God, man. The bag. I think it just moved. I was paralyzed. I wanted to run home. I wanted to save Josh. I wanted to go for help. I wanted so many things, but I just laid there frozen. As I lay unable to move, my eyes focused on the corner of the house that was right under my room. I moved my flashlight. My breath hitched at what I saw. Animals. Dozens of them. All of them dead. They lay in piles all around the perimeter of the crawl space. Could boxes be among these corpses? Was this what the cat food was for? Seeing this broke my shock as I knew I had to get out of there, and I scrambled to the board. I pushed on it, but it wouldn't budge. I couldn't move it because it was wedged in there and I couldn't get my fingers around it since the edges were outside. I was trapped. God damn you, Josh! I whispered to myself. I could feel thunderous footsteps above me. The house was shaking. I heard Josh scream, and it was matched by another scream that wasn't full of fear. As I continued pushing, I felt the board move, but I knew it wasn't me who was moving it. I could hear footsteps above me and in front of me, and shouting and screaming filled the brief silences between the footsteps. I moved back and held my walkie ready to try to defend myself, and the board was thrown to the side and an arm shot in and grabbed for me. Let's go, man, now! It was Josh. Oh, thank God. I scrambled out of the opening, holding the flashlight and the walkie. When we got to the fence, we both jumped it, but Josh's walkie fell. He reached for it, and I told him to forget it. We had to move. Behind us, I could hear yelling, though they weren't words, only sounds. And we, perhaps foolishly, ran for the woods to get back to Josh's quicker and be somewhat harder to follow. The whole way through the woods, Josh kept yelling. My picture! He took my picture! But I knew the man already had Josh's picture, from all those years ago at the ditch. I supposed Josh still thought those mechanical sounds were from a robot. We made it back to Josh's house, and back into his room before his parents woke up. I asked about the big bag, and if it really moved, and he said he couldn't be sure. 
He kept apologizing about dropping the walkie at the house, but obviously that wasn't a big deal. We didn't go to sleep and sat peering out the window waiting for him. I went home later that day as it was about 3 a.m. already. I told my mom the basics of this story a couple days ago. She broke down and was furious about the danger I put myself in. I asked her why she made all those things up about bothering the new owners to stop me from going. Why did she think the house was so dangerous? She became irate and hysterical, but she answered my question. She grabbed my hand and squeezed it harder than I thought her capable of and locked eyes to mine, whispering as if she was afraid of being overheard. Because I never put any fucking blankets or bowls under the house for boxers. You weren't the only one to find them. I felt dizzy. I understood so much now. I understood why she had looked so uneasy after she brought boxes out from under the house on our last day there. She found more than a spider's or rat's nest that day. I understood why we left almost two weeks early. I understood why she tried to stop me from going back. She knew. She knew he made his home under ours, and she kept it from me. I left without saying another word and didn't finish the story for her. But I want to finish it here for you. I got home from Josh's that day. I threw my stuff on the floor and it scattered everywhere. I didn't care. I just wanted to sleep. I woke up around 9 p.m. to the sound of boxes meowing. My heart leapt. He had finally come home. I was a little sick about the fact that if I had just waited a day, none of the previous night's events would have happened, and I'd have boxes anyway. But that didn't matter. He was back. I got off my bed and called for him, looking around to catch a glint of light off his eyes. The crying continued, and I followed it. It was coming from under the bed. I laughed a little, thinking I had just crawled under a house looking for him, and how this was so much better. His meows were being muffled by a shirt, so I flung it aside and smiled, yelling, Welcome home, boxes! His cries were coming from my walkie-talkie. Boxes never came home. Welcome back, kitties. I do hope you enjoyed that chapter in our saga. It will be continued in next week's episode, so be sure to tune in. But for now, I shall bid you all adieu. I am afraid that I must away, ere I stay till the light of day. I hope you found our thrills quite fun, but it does seem our stories are done. I shall return of that you know, but until next time, it's time to go. <laughs> hmm. 
The Mad Catter presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2016 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or their simply public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. And you can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Support Twisted Tea Time by subscribing to us on Patreon at Patreon.com slash TheMadCatter. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com, as well as Jason White, whose work can be found at SoundCloud.com slash Angels Dash of Dash Despair. Details can be found in the show notes. If you want more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on Facebook.com slash Cheshire Hat. Or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. Download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Cheshire Hat. Or visit me at www.themadcatter.net. Good night, kitties. Pleasant dreams. <laughs>